Here's an idea. The question is not whether computers and artificial intelligence can make art. The question is whether we will allow them to make art. From drawing machines to early digital art and now AI, we've wondered whether the fundamentally human seeming endeavor of art making can be done by machines. I say yes, absolutely it can, but, and it's that but that we have to work our way towards. Let's start with some specifics. I hope you're in the mood for jargon. The Google Brain team, a machine intelligence team focused on deep learning, has developed Magenta, a piece of technology that generates art and music using recurrent neural networks, for example, after the un- and semi-supervised computational feature extraction of pre-existing works. Basically, a powerful computer learns what art is by analyzing art, and then it makes its own art based on that art. In short, how cute it thinks it's people! At Moogfest this year, the team played some of Magenta's music. Here's a clip. Catchy. So catchy. Now, Magenta isn't the only machine making art, composing music, writing stories, etc. Far from it, but it's recent, well appointed, and its creator's goals are well documented. In a recent blog post, Magenta researcher Douglas Eck writes about how, in the short term, they want to get this technology into the hands of artists and see what they'll make to build a community of people doing this work. Their long term goals are more grand, let's say. For example, Eck asks, how can we make models like these truly generative, meaning start from truly nothing to create truly something? He also writes about how artists get surprised by new discoveries and have different interests over time. He asks, how do we capture effects like attention and surprise in a machine learning model? The largest challenge, Eck writes, is having a machine generate something that's interesting over a long arc. So much machine-generated music and art is good in small chunks, he writes. So for everybody keeping track at home, that's figuring out one, how to have original ideas, two, how to keep those ideas fresh, and three, sequencing those ideas into a significant and pleasurable final product. Machine or not, that's just making art, period. And to read the headlines, you would think that we are there. Muse, captured, analyzed, deep learned, and neural networked, prepare your soft, meaty body for the truly generative AI masterpieces. But, and here's that but that I mentioned earlier, as I see it, there are at least two challenges to overcome before we have our first AI Warhol. The first challenge isn't everybody's favorite question, but is it really art? I say, if you have to ask if it's art, it probably is. The first challenge really has to do with how audiences will or won't appreciate machine-made works as art. This is gonna seem backwards based on our conversation thus far, but artists, machines, and artist-machine hybrids for as long as there's been art, haven't actually made art. They've made works. Objects, media, performance, software, works. What makes art is an audience. An artist makes a work, and audiences turn that work into art through appreciation. There are certain media styles, audiences, and artists for whom this contract is basically guaranteed. Beautiful oil paintings, ballet, symphonies, Godard films are art. Not because of a shared fundamental characteristic, but because how and why we should appreciate them is understood. They're traditionally beautiful. They were hard to make. They tell a meaningful story, etc., etc. But sitting still for a very long time. Appreciable? For some people, yeah. An arrangement of curved sticks placed in a shallow stream? Deeply affecting for me, for others, stupid and meaningless. Four minutes and 33 seconds of silence. Hugely influential, but to some, the pinnacle of the art world's laziness, bravado, and hucksterism. These are works some audiences don't turn into art, often because it's unclear what about them deserves appreciation. Machine-generated works could have an even harder time than sitting, sticks, and silence, I think. There are some new and exceptionally challenging facets to its appreciation. Up until this point, art practice has sat atop a kind of poetry, a world of meaning, sometimes hidden but present, even and often especially if it's not agreed upon. Art has been a testament to the organization, technique, or skill of a creator. Even the, I could have done that stuff, is the result of labor and sacrifice. For better or worse, the human appreciation of art by human beings is built on a framework that values work, physical and intellectual, meaning and intention, even when it's murky or unsuccessful, and subjectivity, the perspectives and background of the artist. This framework applies not at all, or in a totally different way, to entirely machine-made work, which is 
the direct result of a very different kind of labor, which lacks intended meaning and which is the result of zero subjectivity, or as discussed in our face swap episode, is the result of an experience totally unlike our own. Now, I'm not saying we can't or don't appreciate AI art or that machines aren't creative. Just that the nature of that creativity is hard for humans to internalize. Margaret Bowden writes about how David Cope, composer and pioneer of machine creativity, destroyed the database of his music writing program, Emmy, after 25 years because, quote, even those who did appreciate Emmy's scores tended to regard them not as music, but as computer output. And as such, they were seen as infinitely reproducible and devalued accordingly. Ironic, Bowden points out, now that Emmy is decommissioned. It's also worth noting, I think, that many successful machine-made works, like the music of Iamas or Cope's subsequent machine creativity project, Emily Howell, or the screenplay for Sunsprings, rely heavily on interpretation by humans, making the machine provenance of the source a novelty which excuses the search for meaning instead of encouraging it, by which I mean, it's difficult to say what Benjamin, the AI that wrote Sunsprings, could possibly be getting at because Benjamin is an artificial intelligence. The common sense read is that Benjamin is getting at nothing. Whatever you need to know about the presence of the story, I'm a little bit of a boy on the floor. This reflexive reaction is boring and hard to avoid, really. In time, maybe it'll fade, or maybe we'll learn how to appreciate machine meaning, or maybe machines will create more human-like meaning. That's probably the most likely. But for now, both critically and practically, humans need to be close to machine-generated works so they're in human terms, so they fit within the traditional structures we often argue make art what it is. Which brings us to Robo Warhol complication number two. In addition to asking if we can appreciate machine-made works on their own terms, I think we may ask if the machines are really making that work. Bear with me here for a second. Remember Eck saying that he wanted to arrive at a truly generative process? That challenge has two parts. The first is figuring out how to make Magenta's creativity causing algorithms and sources as chaotic as a human artist's. Primarily, this may lead us to reflect on how, or if, any creative practice is truly generative. Is originality simply a cipher for unknowable yet deterministic complexity? CF Bart, Death of the Author, Kirby Ferguson, everything is a remix, the creative ether, there are no new ideas, etc., etc., etc. The second part of the truly generative challenge, the part that Eck doesn't really get into, has to do with independence and intent. Machines have been making art for a very long time, but they've always been guided by humans. Brushes have painted paintings, typewriters have written literature, cameras, photos, computers, movies, video games, music. But none of these things are independent. They require direct and sometimes constant human involvement. And the humans, not the tools, are rightly credited with making the work. Magenta and technology like it complicates this. For now, Magenta is like a typewriter, a tool for artists. But the hope, it seems, is that it'll eventually create art by itself, if it hasn't already. The brain team created a complex, powerful typewriter that may eventually write something original, fresh, and significant without constant and direct human involvement. But will it ever do so without human involvement period? Like Twitter bots, which can assemble remarkably human-seeming thoughts, and aleatoric music or visual art, which mitigates the conscious intentions of the artist, artificial intelligence may assemble source material in unimagined ways, but are its algorithms so far removed from the intentions or aims of its programmers? I would wager that the truly generative isn't truly original, since true originality exists perhaps in name only. The truly generative, I think, is the truly independent. Speaking with the MIT Tech Review, Georgia Tech professor Mark Rydell put it like this, neural networks are kind of in the imitation mode. You can pipe in the works of the classics and they'll learn patterns, but they need to learn creative intent somewhere. This is especially interesting given the current conversation about the ripple effect of algorithmic decision-making. Not decision-making done by algorithms, but the decision-making processes of humans who design algorithms. The romance is that algorithms decide. They sort and measure so that we don't have to. They do it better and faster, more logically, and with less bias. The reality is that humans bring their humanity and bias 
to every piece of technology they build, even if it operates autonomously. This is what leads to situations where, even though they're placed algorithmically, Google searches for popular male African-American names are more likely to generate ad results suggestive of arrest. Or even though it's determined algorithmically, people who live in areas with a dense Asian population were automagically charged more for online SAT prep. Tons of sources for these stories and a lot more in the doobly-doo, by the way. Of course, we'll hope that machine-made art isn't literally racist, but it's naive to assume creative tech can shun human intent. Maybe there's a watering down process on the way where people design an algorithm which designs another algorithm which designs another until all of the humanity is scrubbed away and also it's the singularity and I for one welcome our new robot blah 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 blah. But for now and the near future, Magenta isn't flying solo. It's autonomous, yes, impressively so, but will its relationship to Google ever be besides the point? Will it ever not be a project of the brain team who will probably continue writing blog posts about it, who maintain its operation and manage its technology? The question concerning artificial intelligence then isn't, can machines make art? Because they already do. One question is, will we allow machines to make art by themselves? What conditions must be met for us to look at artificially intelligent art output and think of that work not as agentive, not as doing work at the command of a human or extending human capability, but as independently derived? How can we see a machine as having made its own art? And pending that, another question is which of us, which we, will appreciate that art? And how will it be appreciated? We can easily find novelty in machine works, but will humans always be the gold standard for meaningful art making? Will AI produced works ever be treated as art is traditionally treated, widely traded, curated, collected, critiqued? And maybe more importantly, can it ever be understood as created by an artist, but divorced at last from all the messy stuff often considered inextricable from the practice? Ideas, feelings, whims, labor, and humanity. What do y'all think? Will we ever see machine-made works as made independently of human control? And under what conditions do you think that might happen? And when or if it does, how do you think we will appreciate those things? How will that appreciation differ maybe from the way that we've appreciated art up until that point? Let us know in the comments and I'll respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. In this week's comment response video, we talk about your thoughts regarding Jaif for life. Also, there were uh, a lot of requests for Jaif for Life merchandise, which we're gonna work on that. We just released the hat, so we gotta give that a little while. I'm told that that's a best practice to not just release like a thousand t-shirts and merch things all at the same time. Uh, but the next time that we have an opportunity uh, to release something and it makes sense to do it, rest assured, it will have the word Jaif on it. And in case you missed it, yesterday we actually released an Idea Channel episode that was written by an artificial intelligence. It was trained on the entirety of the Idea Channel corpus, almost five years worth of scripts, uh, as kind of an experiment of what it's like to do that kind of thing, what it's like to experience it. So if you wanna watch that, we'll put a link in the doobly-doo and also, you know, probably something around here or way over there somewhere. But most importantly, it was so great seeing everybody at VidCon. It was just, you know, VidCon is always a blast and I think it keeps getting better and better. And it's just, it's awesome to see the same people uh, every year. It's awesome to meet new people. So I just wanna say thank you to everyone who came to the panels that I moderated, who came to the meetup, who just stopped me to say, hey, it was, yeah, it was a lot of fun. We have a Facebook, an IRC, and a subreddit links in the doobly-doo. And the tweet of the week comes from Darcy Painter, who points us towards a clipping music video. If you don't know clipping, they're like a sort of noise hip-hop group slash person. Uh, they're really great. I really like their work. And in this music video, there is not only Jife-inspired editing, but there just are Jifes, like well-known animated Jifes used to illustrate some of the lyrics in the music video. And it's really, it's very interesting. And also I, I just like the song. I think it's worth a watch. Uh, just fair warning though, there is some language. I mean, there's language in many places. There's, there is, um, there are four letter words. Well, there, I mean, there, okay, you get what I'm saying.